Uh, so, so we're saying, are we assuming population growth? Yeah. And then, uh, right. Okay. So, um, yeah, don't worry about, don't worry about out of steady state dynamics here. Uh, in general, it could be that, you know, like, so like when we, when we get those R dot terms, that's basically, that's what's happening here is that we're allowing for this to, to be, to, for there to be reallocation between P and R over time in principle, because like R dot would be changing, R would be changing and then P would be changing exactly in the opposite way to counteract it. We, when we drive the original equilibrium, we allow for that and, and then rule it out ex, ex post. Um, so here for these problems, don't worry about, uh, don't worry about how state dynamics. So you can, you can assume where you're looking at R dot equals zero case. Um, but in general, you know, that would be something you could prove, right? Uh, even, even when we had Ramsey, you know, you could, let's see. Yeah. So, so when, we have, when we have Ramsey, I mean, we have, um, in general, you know, like C can, that, that stuff can change over time, but we know that sort of in a balanced growth path, uh, it should, it should eventually equilibrate in some way right so yeah gr is n uh no you can you can assume that gr is n assume that yeah the the yeah so l is growing out so assume that the proportions are constant and sort of like look for equilibria where the proportions are constant basically yeah for the proportion of uh, uh, P and R with respect to L. So P over L and R over L. You can, you're can you looking for, uh, yeah. So you're, you're looking for that when, it's, when that's constant. Uh, yeah, another way to say it is you can assume that the growth rate of R is N and then you're finding the shares R over L and P over L. Does that make sense? We feel good about that. Good enough. Um, so because like, yeah. So now, now we're no longer we no longer like find the growth rate. Like the growth rate is sort of, sort of apparent from this equation, from the standard Jones logic. The new equilibrium like outcome is like SR is like the, the R over L basically. That's that's what we're interested in. Yeah, so this SR down here, yeah. Okay. We can talk about that more later if you want. Uh, we can talk about it more now if you guys are, if there's, if there's interest. Um, otherwise, we can keep going with lecture. What? Yeah. Okay. Yep. N zero and L zero. You can, um, it's not going to make a big difference in the end, basically. I mean, you can assume they're one if you want. I mean, in, in general, though, it shouldn't, um, I think, yeah, I mean, it shouldn't, it shouldn't make a big difference what you assume, because like at the end of the day, because of, because of this Jones equation here, this production function for ideas, you're going to get some proportionality between N and R, right? So like basically, basically N is going to kind of go faster or slower until it gets into the right kind of proportion with R. Okay. Um, you know, cause like, let me just fire up the, the, so, so like, you know, for that, that production function for ideas, um, and that equals 
Again, the end of the phi r. So what is the just r? Okay, um, right. So then that means that g is n over n, which is going to be gamma. In this case, gamma r over n to the one minus phi. Okay, and then that means in so in like a steady state equilibrium, we should have that g r is equal to one minus phi times g. Okay, and therefore, uh, which and this is equal to n. We're saying that this is going to be n because it, it's constant proportionality, and so g is equal to n over one minus phi. So that's like a special case of the the more general formula. Um, okay, and so then once you have that though, uh, So we'll think about it like this. It, so we know that G is equal to this thing here. We've also just solved for G equals N over N over one minus phi. So it's like N over one minus phi is equal to gamma R over N to the N raised to the one minus phi, different N. Okay, so then here, I mean, you, you, so you could, like here you can basically solve for N, right? So like N to the one minus phi uh, of T really um, is one minus phi over N times gamma R. Right, so which is you know like if you plug in you know, it's gamma s r s r times l right. So here is saying n you know if you move the fiber n of t is some function of the stuff n and l right. So you can get um you get, you can get exactly what n is and l is moving exogenously right. And so you, you know exactly what n is going to be at a given time. So actually there you know it's because of this equilibrating action. That that's uh you got you have like history erasing you end up in the same place regard regardless of where you started, right? I guess that's ergodicity or something, right? So so you you in the end it's not going to matter what n zero was. It is going to matter what l zero is for just scale, right? But it's not it's not going to like make a big difference for the outcome. But it, it'll matter for scale. But like you can assume l zero is one if you want. Um, but it you can it not it's not going to change like your your what you find for sr or anything like that. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, okay. So uh -huh. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, think about it like this. You're setting, you're choosing SR. What? My default microphone is, hold on. Zoom is freaking out here. Uh, so you're choosing, like, like, think about it like SR. Just randomly changed my microphone. Okay, can you guys hear me still? Okay, cool. Um, so think about like as you change. Let's see. I want to make sure I get this right. So if you change, I mean. Yeah, I mean, if you change SR here, that's going to change this ratio, right? Um, so, so if you change, if you increase SR, you're you're going to push up uh, the level of N, basically, right? So, so this is like the Jones thing. If we push up SR, it's not going to have a change. It's not going to change the long run growth, but it will change the level of N. You're going to like push research a little bit harder. And it's going to equilibrate and, and research will get more difficult over time so you get the same growth rate, but it will increase the level of N relative to L, right? So you can think about it as like SR is the equilibrium outcome, 
okay, that's determined by incentives and everything like that, the free entry condition. Um, that's gonna push. That's gonna determine this ratio, okay? Because n is endogenous, right? So I think it's it's best to think about it as like going from SR to this ratio. Um, and, and like, yeah. And so, so when you guys are in the French, when you're working through the three entry condition, you're going to end up with stuff like this. Okay. And you're going to have to kind of like figure out how to sub in for this with SR in the correct way, such that you get an equation for SR. Okay. So that's, that's really the key is when you're in the free entry condition, things are going to kind of balance out and then you're going to get an equation for SR. Okay. Um, gonna... So does that, yeah. So I mean like, yeah. So, so, so really you want to think about it as SR as your equilibrium variable and then everything else is determined by that. Um, yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, which, which equation this one, uh, the last one. So, so the N the capital N though is endogenous. Remember the level of capital N is endogenous. So this moves capital N and SR moves. Yeah. So this is a steady state equation. Remember this is only in steady state because we used G star here. So we, we derive this with, in steady state basically. So in the long run steady state, you change SR in the long run and will change. It is true. So th this isn't true outside of steady state basically. Outside of steady state, the only thing that's really true is this, is that you're gonna choose SR, which is the term in R, that's gonna determine the rate of change of N. That's still true, but, it, but at the same time, if you just look at steady state, you say, okay, what if I change SR and then wait a while, this equation will be kind of determining what happens in the long run, okay? So yeah, like everything after here, you know, like this is all steady state stuff basically. And then the only thing that's a short run true is, is, is this one, which, and then here you can, you do have the, that's equal to SR times L, right? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can sub like, like here, this equation. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah, you want to sub, you want to sub this in. You want to sub. Yep. Yeah. So you're, you're focusing on steady state outcomes. And so at that point you can sort of invoke these steady state, uh, these steady state relationships basically. Um, so, so if, I mean, if you, if you have something that with N one minus five, I mean, it's still true, you know, but you, you know, you can, there's more you can do. If you can, if you could sub that in the SR and things kind of cancel and you find an equation that just has SR, then that's better. Cause you know, basically you're, it's a guess and check. You're saying, okay, let's guess we're in a steady state. And if you're in a steady state, and shouldn't show up in the uh, the equation for for SR, right? Because otherwise things would be moving around over time. Um, yeah. So it, it should be that things cancel, and then you just get an equation with SR and, and no N or L. All right. Okay, uh, any other questions on the homework? Seems like no. Okay. Um, 
All right. Well, then, if that that that's the case, then uh, let's move ahead here. Okay. Um, all right. So, so last time, at the end, we'd basically derive. We'd basically looked at that that free entry graph um, for uh, uh, the Schumpeterian creative destruction model. So we had, um, you know, just you know, we had like, yep. Icon. Oh, it is. Yeah, uh, I'm recording it before it gets to Zoom. Yeah, so I'm 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 like streaming to Zoom thing. So yeah, uh, yeah. I guess so. That means yeah. I mean that means it's just because I'm putting it on YouTube. I don't I don't I don't I don't know what the the sort of norms are for like recording conversations. So you should yeah you should should list, listen up to these and 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 write down stuff that you want to like remember remember for later. Okay. Uh, to like the 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 discussion part, basically, right? Um, yep. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So we were doing. Sorry. Uh, we you know the, sort of at the end of the last class we were looking at um, this graph where we had marginal benefit and marginal cost. So we're we're in, we're, in, we're interpreting that. Franchin condition as a marginal benefit equals marginal cost kind of thing. Okay. Um, let me quickly pull up my notes here. Uh, okay. And um, yeah, so, so like in that, you know, in that, in this case we had, you know, sorry, I remember our uh, production function for ideas. Was that you know tau, okay, is equal to r to gamma times r. Okay, so that gamma is our um, productivity of researchers. Okay, so each researcher produces gamma, the value is v, and then the marginal cost is w. Okay, because that's how much you have to pay the researcher. Okay, um, so so we and then you you know you plug in everything. That's how we solve for the equilibrium. But there you know we we found basically the the marginal cost. Okay. Um, kind of looks like this. So it starts somewhere above z. It, it starts at one, I think. So that goes up, okay, as you might expect. And the marginal benefit, you know, is, is going down somehow like that, okay. And basically, okay, let me. Uh, do we? Yeah. So maybe I don't. I don't have the exact equations in my notes here, but you know, we we found something basically where the marginal cost curve is going up and the marginal benefit curve is going down and essentially what was happening was the uh with marginal cost okay i mean you, you this is remember this is r okay we're looking at the research share here and then over here we're looking at kind of marginal benefit marginal cost essentially marginal cost goes up because the more you use for production the less you're using for uh sorry the more you use for research the less you're using for production and so you know you have sort of like you're putting less and less into production and things are getting more and more dire. Okay. So that, that cost is going up. Okay. That's just coming from the production function basically. And then, um, the marginal benefit. Okay. You kind of have, um, you have your, you have your profits and everything. And those are kind of proportional looking. Remember the profits look like this. They were like Lambda over one plus Lambda times Y. Okay. They, they were as proportional to output. Okay. Um, but then in the value right, you had, um, you know, some, some creative destruction, right? So you had the value is like, uh, something like this. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so it's, it's R minus G, but it ends up being the discount rate. So the value is going to be like the discount rate plus creative destruction, which is, you know, rho plus gamma r. Okay, so so more r means more creative destruction, which means your value goes down, your effective discount rate goes up. That's why this MB curve here is going down. Okay, it would look a little bit more smooth, but you know, that's what we got. Okay, so that's going to give you that r star. Okay, and then also um, it allows you to kind of think about efficiency. Okay, and so what the last thing I said last time was, let's use the ruler for straight lines here. I don't think I can freehand this. Um, 
the main thing I said last time, okay, that should be a flat straight line, uh, was that the marginal benefit, like for the social planner, okay, which we'll call, sorry, not marginal cost, marginal benefit, uh, for the social planner should be flat. Okay, so the social planner doesn't care about creative destruction. They just care about improving productivity. Okay, so 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 kind of argued that that should be flat. All right. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of where we were, and then but you know so we haven't exactly done the social planner yet. Okay, so we can work on that. Okay, so there's kind of two things um, that I want to talk about. Is well, so one is the social planner. There's like a million things that I want to talk about, but one of the things is the social planner. Uh, the other thing is how do we actually get growth? Okay, so last time. You know, we found our star. Okay, and just to refresh my memory, uh, let's see, what is our star? Our star ended up being lambda minus delta over gamma over one plus lambda. Okay, so some kind of reasonable looking function of lambda, delta, and uh, gamma. Okay, so. Um, I guess we're using delta for discount rate. Okay, I don't know. I'm being a little inconsistent about whether it's delta or rho for discount rate, but either of those are the discount rate and they're equal to each other. Okay, so, um, and actually they're kind of like almost rotationally analogous. If you rotate a delta 180 degrees, it's kind of a weird, no, it's not, it's not quite, but it's almost there. Um, so yeah, so you get some you know reasonable looking thing for that. And that maps into tau star, you just multiply by gamma. So you get gamma lambda minus delta over one plus lambda. Okay, so we can get those in a fairly straightforward manner once we solve for, for R star, okay? Um, and then G is the question, okay? So I asserted last time that G was the log of one plus lambda times tau, okay? Which makes sense. I mean, you, know, more, you, need, you need research happening that looks like tau and you need like successful research. And then you, each time you have research, you know, lambda kicks in and, and bumps up productivity. Exactly why this is log of one plus lambda is the question, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, so let's do that. Okay, so let's talk about, and th this this keys into a more general discussion of, you know, how do we, when we have these sorts of aggregates, how do we um, discover, or derive their, their growth rate in general? Okay, so um, remember, so we're thinking, so remember G is the growth rate of Q, okay? So, so the, the basic setup was that Y was equal to Q times P, so some aggregate of productivity times the, the amount of labor being used for production. And then that Q was just defined, like we, we derived all this, but the Q was by definition, this integral, this log log aggregation of all the QIs. So Q is equal to E to the this whole integral here, okay? So you, you take this, Cobb Douglas style aggregation, which exactly mirrors the 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 what the production function itself looked like. Okay, and then you get um, in equilibrium on the production side, you get that y equals qp. Okay, so then the question is, what is uh, what is the um, growth rate of q? Okay, so and that's so and then you know also by definition, you know g is equal to q dot over q. Okay, so g is the growth rate of q. All right, so all right, we can do this. Uh, so the first thing to note is that, you know, if we're looking for the growth rate of Q, this is also equal to, you know, DDT of the log of Q. Okay, so that's that's a good thing. Um, and so we, we don't have to like invert this and find stuff. We can just work directly with the log of Q, find its derivative over time, and then we're all set, okay? And so how do we find derivatives? Well, uh, you can't just, you know, take the derivative, okay, here, because it doesn't quite make sense. Because what's happening is, recall, you have a unit continuum, okay, of product lines, right, from zero to one. And they're kind of, they're, they're at different levels of Q, okay, there's some distribution, okay. And then at some point, randomly sort of, you know, you know, someone comes up in the innovation, they boot out the old firm, and this goes uh, from, you know, the, this goes up by a factor of lambda. Okay, I don't know how to draw this, but it goes up by a factor of lambda. Okay, and then later on, like this one, 
goes up by a factor of lambda. Okay, so there's just all these, you know, and there's a continuum, obviously, it's not just a discrete number here, but, you know, this is happening over time. Okay, but at any, any given time, and then over, over any given short interval delta, basically a very small number of product lines is actually being improved. Okay, so, so like, at a, at like a hyper specific time, like in some sense, no product lines are being improved. So like the derivative isn't well defined. Like if you took the derivative and said, what's D, DQI DT, that would be zero almost always. And then very occasionally it would be like infinite, right? So so the, the, the notion of a derivative, you can't just easily map it in here, okay? But you can say in aggregate, how does it change over time? And if, if you're just careful, okay? So to do that, we're gonna, we're gonna do this discrete uh, approach here, okay, discrete time approach, where we have some time interval delta, right, that's much less than one, okay, that's important. And the other thing to note is that these increment processes, these are all those Poisson processes that I was talking about last time, okay? Um, and so, yeah, they have those same properties, independence across time, linearity of probability for, for small time intervals and stuff like that. Okay, so that's what we're going to use, and that's why we need delta much less than one. Okay. Um, so it, turn, it turns out that the, the poisson, the word, means fish in French. Um, I don't know why. This has nothing to do with fish in my mind. I think maybe the guy's name was was, was poisson. Uh, maybe his, his ancestors were fishermen. Fisher people. Uh, okay, so that's what I'm going to go with. I haven't looked it up on Wikipedia yet, though. So um, let's take this discrete time approach, uh, small times up delta, and we're going to say is okay. What's the? We want to find the derivative. Okay, so the derivative is going to be the thing at t plus delta minus the thing at t divided by delta. Okay, so first we need to find the thing at t, um, and the thing here is log of q. All right, so what is log of q at t plus delta? Okay, so uh, well, what's that going to be? So basically, um, there's kind of two ways to interpret this that are equivalent. Okay. One way to interpret it is that each individual, uh, QI will with probability Delta tau. Okay. Experience creative destruction and hence will get incremented by the factor Lambda. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. I'm, I keep missing the chat here. It's all the way over on the right side for me. Uh, okay, doesn't matter. Dora, Dora's noting that we used row so far. Okay, so I'm gonna try and stick with row. Okay, and if it, in the notes, I think I have some old deltas lying around. I'll I'll change those up to right because I mean it makes sense because delta is the the um delta is the depreciation rate, so we don't want to double up on that. We should use row. Okay, so uh, I'll do that. Um, all right. So then, uh, okay. So then. The, there's two interpretations. One is that for each individual QI, there's a probability delta tau of getting hit by the innovation, creative destruction check. You increment, and if you don't get hit, you don't increment. Okay, that's one way. The other way I think about it is like a fraction of this unit interval delta tau will get hit by it, which is which is true either way, uh, and they get incremented, and then some other fraction won't. Okay, they're they're kind of equivalent in the sense of like law of large numbers. Okay, so let's do the first one though. Let's say, you know, we're integrating over zero, one, okay? And uh, for each i, these are independent across i, remember? So um, for each i, there's some probability that you get hit by, I guess I'm gonna end up putting this in big brackets. There's some probability you get hit by creative destruction check and that's delta tau, okay? And in that case, um, this value is gonna be after, like after that delta increment, uh, the value is gonna be log of, uh, we're going to need parentheses here, log of one plus lambda times QI of T. So the QI of T is the original value that that QI had. It got incremented because it got hit by the creative destruction shock. Okay. And so that's the new value. Otherwise, one minus delta tau probability, nothing happens. Log of Q of I of T, and I'll put it in parentheses here. Okay, and then and that square bracket, remember our integral, whatever that thing is called, di. Um, okay, and that should be what, what our answer is. Okay, so this is first step. I mean, we at least have something written down, and then we're going to 
simplify this. Okay, so we know we're going to use linearity of integration. That's going to be useful. We're going to use separability in this case of the logarithm. And actually, we're going to get something real nice looking. Okay, so um, let's do that. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, um, so, so you can separate these additively, the integral. Okay, in fact, there's some stuff out. All right, so let's let's do this one step at a time. Okay, so the first the first term is going to be that delta tau term, and here we're going to have log of one plus lambda q i of t. Okay, uh, d i. Okay, and then we're going to have this other integral with the one minus delta tau, integral zero to one log of q i of t. Okay, so we got that, and note, note that this is just q log of qt and we can use that in a moment okay um all right okay and so then the other thing is on the left hand term uh the first term we can split this out into a log of one plus lambda okay which is our, that term that we ended up getting in the in the answer okay and then the other side which is going to be kind of q looking okay so delta tau so this, this log of one plus lambda integrated from zero to one just gives us log of one plus lambda. Here we don't have to worry about n's popping out because n is equal to one, okay? So here we get this. This is actually the answer to the growth that we get eventually, okay? And we'll see why that is. Um, okay, and then plus delta tau integral from zero to one of log of q i of t dt, and then plus one minus delta tau that whole integral, okay? That should, of course, be di, not dt. That would be crazy. di. Okay, so um, there we go. And then you can see the last two terms, they sum to 1, okay? The last two terms, it's not to 1. They, the the delta, delta tau plus 1 minus delta tau, given the, the same uh, other term here, it means that that just gives you this log of one plus lambda plus integral. So these, this is just the log of q i of t now. Okay, so cool, all right? And then the final thing is to just note that that second term is, is the log of q of t. This is the log of q of t. That's the definition of q of t, all right? That's pretty much it, okay? I almost spilled my coffee there. That would have been a tragedy. Um, uh, that's pretty much it because we can subtract this over. We can divide by delta and we get something nice. Okay, so let's do that. So log of q of t plus delta minus the log of q of t divided by delta is tau times log of 1 plus lambda. Okay, so now this, okay, and then this is you know, take the limit, formally speaking, take the limit as delta goes to zero. Okay, and on the left-hand side, we get q dot, uh, sorry, we, okay, we get ddt of, I'm behind my, I'm behind myself here. Let's fix that. Okay, getting ever so slightly better over time about that. Um, so we're going to get ddt of, log q, you can drop the t's now, is equal to tau log of 1 plus lambda, and that's that's g, okay? Okay, so g is equal to tau, or, you know, log 1 plus lambda times tau, or whatever, which is all the way up here, which is what we asserted before, with the, the order is reversed, okay? So, um, yeah, uh, that's what you get. Um, and so here, and it's even nice because here, like, you know, in general, you might get deltas over here that, that limit to zero here. We just got, you know, the delta just disappeared before the limit even, which, you know, it doesn't matter either way. And at the end of the day, what matters is what happens when you take the limit. Okay, so so that's how you, you find the growth rate of, a, of an index like this. Okay, this one is relatively straightforward because it's a logarithmic index and things separate nicely and linearly, linearly in the logs. Um, you know, if you... Uh, I guess you might, are you going to need this for the homework? You might, I don't know if you're going to need, you may need this for the homework, um, but I guess, 
yeah. You may or may not need this for the homework. I can't I can't decide right now. But you know, in general, you might have an aggregation that is not logarithmic, where you know you maybe have something like this. Uh, okay. Yeah, you know, so you have some CES aggregation. Okay, so I guess in the you know in the homework we had we we would have if I'm writing it like this it would be like modulo flipping the the epsilon coefficients you know it would be like something like this. It's probably it's probably epsilon minus one over epsilon. Um, but you know, either way, it does it doesn't make a big difference. So let's say we let's say we had this. Okay, so um, if you had this more complicated aggregator rather than just log log, okay, you can still um, you can still do it. Okay, um, usually what you would do is is a similar approach. You'd say, okay, well let, let's let's find. Uh, the growth rate of this thing, this c to the epsilon minus one over epsilon. Okay, so so bring out that outer exponent. Find the growth rate of this. Okay, saying okay, you know, look at t plus delta. Factor that all through. You're going to get something that's not so clean, but you're going to get like a proportional thing that you have to divide. Okay, and then like just note that the growth rate of uh, not epsilon of c, the epsilon one is one over epsilon is equal to epsilon minus one over epsilon times the growth rate of C. Okay, so you know once you find the growth rate of this thing here, you just mult you you would mult you'd move this over, you'd multiply by epsilon over epsilon minus one to get the growth rate of C itself. Okay, so that's how you would do it here. Instead of doing the log trick, you, you kind of do something similar. You find the growth rate of this thing and then just note that the growth rate is going to be proportional to C itself with the correct adjustment factor. Okay. Do that at the end though. Okay, don't don't work through the whole huge thing. Okay. Um that's my advice. Okay, but but it's the same idea where you break it into cases on an I by I basis and and factor things out. Okay. Um all right, so that's that's kind of how you do growth rates. Okay, that that's important and it's something it's like you know it's it's gonna show up more generally, okay, and you want to get the hang of how to apply this more generally to, to you know, just to find the growth rate of any kind of index that you could imagine. Okay, that's will be useful. Uh, it, may, it may be useful in your future endeavors. Okay, so um, all right, so that's growth rates. Uh, I guess we can move on to the social planner. Are there any questions on on uh, growth rate stuff before we jump into the old Schumpeterian social planner? Okay, seems like a negative there. All right. Um, okay. New page. Let us turn a page continuously. Uh, so I don't know. Schumpeter. Ian. Yeah, they are a social planner of the Schumpeterian nature. Um, well, actually, they're really not Schumpeterian because they don't care about they don't care about creative destruction that much. But they're still a social planner. They're they're at least that. Okay, so um, all right. So to do this, we we only need a few facts from from the previous equilibrium just, uh, derivation. Okay, so we're still um, let's see how should I say this. Uh, we only really need two things. Okay, so one one is an assumption, which is which is carried over, which is important. Which is that uh, I'm gonna write this backwards, not n dot um, tau. That rate of creative destruction. Okay, so here, like, you know, since this, since I'm I'm sort of saying that this is a non schumpeterian social planner in the sense that they don't care about creative destruction. We don't really want to call this creative destruction anymore. We, it's just the innovation rate. Okay. So tau, tau like here, it's, it's really just the innovation or yeah, successful research rate. Okay. We call it creative destruction in the model because that's, that's you know, 
the creative part and the destructive part are important for incentives. For the social planner, only the creative part is important. The destructive part, I mean, it's not a big deal for them, okay? Um, so we can call it the innovation right now, uh, but it's the same thing. And it's equal to tau, it's equal to gamma times r, right? So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is output. Okay, so this isn't exactly an assumption, but the, the notion that y is equal to q times p, okay? So yeah, I mean, in, in, in some sense, this is a derivation, okay? Imagine you have the problem of this, okay? You're uh, maximizing over li, okay? And you're, you're going to maximize over all these li. Okay, so whatever that notation is, let's call it really weird looking curly brackets. Uh, over all the li, uh, output y, okay, which I'll, which is going to be equal to, you know, um, this whole integral of the logs. Okay, and here we can, we're going to, instead of writing yi, we're going to explicitly write out the dependence on li. So you got a bunch of product lines with a bunch of different qis. And you want to know, how do I apportion all this labor, such that the labor sums up to P, how do I apportion it to uh, all these different product lines? Okay, now things are pretty symmetric. Okay, uh, they're pretty like well-behaved. Okay, so you might guess that you should choose a symmetric outcome. And in fact, that will be the case. Okay, so that's that's going to give us this. Okay, this the answer to this, which is relatively simple, is going to give us this. Okay, so... How do we do this? Well, you can just write down a, yeah, and, and um, you know, well, okay. We're, we're the object, think about the objective function. Instead of choosing y, we're just choosing y. Instead of choosing y, we, we should just choose log y. I mean, why should we make our lives harder? It's it's a monotonic transform of the true objective function. Like So it's, it's like utility, it doesn't matter. So we could choose log i too. And that's going to make our lives easier. So let's let's maximize the log of y, log of y, uh, subject to this constraint. It's going to be the same answer. Okay. So then our Lagrangian is that objective function here, the log of y, which I've written out, uh, plus uh, ooh, lambda. Let's not use lambda. Uh, let's use mu. Okay. But that's just a Lagrange multiplier. Mu is just a, it's not a Hamiltonian thing. Okay. Uh, times p. So let's let's write it like this so that we're subtracting li's. Okay. Um, and you know, like if if you look at this, I mean, this is just logarithms are great. You know, uh, we can separate this out. This is just log of the integral of q, which is log of q plus uh, integral of log of li di plus uh, mu times this whole thing. Okay, so we've already kind of simplified things and we've already basically shown that Q is not gonna matter for this calculation, okay? Because it's just an additive constant in this whole this whole thing here. And then, I mean, um, so, uh, Now we want to maximize over li. Okay. Um, I mean, we could we could combine the integrals. We could not. Okay. Let's not. Um, all right. And this is another one of those maxima thing where it's like we kind of take the derivative as if li is itself important at the aggregate level, but it's really an almost always thing. Um, so the derivative would be for li is like one over li. This is gonna be zero is equal to one over li uh, minus mu, okay? Which implies that li is equal to one over mu, okay? So all the li's are the same, right? Mu is just a number, whatever it is, they're all the same. If they're all the same and they integrate from on a unit interval to p, well then they all have to be equal to p, in fact, right? So, you, or you could, you could plug in you know, you could plug into that uh, constraint and say that p is equal to the integral from zero to one of one over mu, okay, which is equal to one over mu, all right, which means that mu is equal to one over p, okay, which means that li is, is equal to p, okay, but we can see intuitively if they're all the same, 
then for consistency at the aggregate level, it's all going to be equal to P. Uh, we got a question. Uh, I missed another question. I need to figure out how to put the chat window on the other side. That's probably impossible. Uh, is this a new homework, which is coming up? What do you mean? Is there, uh, is there going to be a new homework? Oh, the, um, that may be, so, so that, that, that might be useful. Let me, let me see. Okay. So that would be, I think that would be, uh, potentially useful in this homework. Now I'm trying to decide. Uh, one second. Yeah, for the second question, I forget how the the answer. Oh no, but that's expanding. You know what? It's the, it's it's sorry. I was I was mistaken. Those are both expanding varieties. Um, no, it, it's not going to be useful. I was I was thinking it might be useful for the current homework, but but it's not because of the, those are both expanding varieties. Uh, it'll be useful for for if we have some kind of Schumacherian model with with this more general thing, but yeah, um, I guess so. It may be useful in the next homework, which is gonna have to be, which which might be more. Yeah, it's gonna be a shorter homework because we don't have much time. So, but but it may be useful depending on what what we do in that in that homework. Okay. Uh, yep. Um, okay. So. All right, so, so this is like a lengthy derivation saying, okay, again, our social planners set up, they're going to set up the production side, in fact, in the same way, roughly, that the uh, uh, the equilibrium did, okay? They're going to do it completely symmetrically, okay? And so that once you get that, once you get that Li is equal to P, then they're all constant. That immediately means that Y is equal to QP, right? So like... Um, you know, think think about here. Like this is, this is log y, okay, and here this is this is that would be log of q plus this, which is going to be the log of p, okay. So so you know basically, uh, you know, y you know, the log, the logarithm of y, okay. Let's let's try that again. Uh, log y, right, is this integral. Okay, which which whatever the case may be about L is equal to log of Q plus the integral of all the Li's. Okay. But we know that all the Li's now are P. Okay, so this is log of Q plus log of P. Okay. So log of y equals log q plus log p. That just means that if you exponentiate both sides, that means y equals qp. All right. So in fact, because kind of the symmetry and the concavity of this problem, the social planner does the same thing as the equilibrium in terms of uh, production. Okay. So there's actually not many um, monopoly distortions aren't so bad here. Okay. Uh, Yeah, they don't create perfect incentives, but there's not a huge, there's not a production misallocation here. Okay. Um, like relative, like between product lines. Okay. Um, okay. So, so that's like a big lengthy derivation for the social planner production side, but you know, sort of like the end result is y equals QP, which is the same as we had before. Okay. So that's really all we need um, to set up this, this Hamiltonian. Okay, all right, so now we're gonna set up a Hamiltonian. So we've solved the static side. We're gonna plug that in and solve a dynamic problem. That's like usually how it goes is you you solve the static allocation problem, okay? And sometimes it's not as kind of symmetric as this, okay? Sometimes it's a little bit more nuanced, okay? Uh, like in the lab equipment model, uh, but in this case, it's relatively straightforward. You use the output of that static allocation problem to inform your dynamic problem, okay? So let's... Let's do that. Okay, so I'm gonna like that's still equal to zero. I'm just gonna like carve out a little space here. All right. So um, what does that give us? Okay, so then our Hamiltonian is what? Uh, so we have. Let me write some notes here. Make sure I don't go too far astray. So we have consumption and output, basically utility. All right. 
Um, let's be our first term. So we're yeah. So we've we've been assuming log utility. Okay, so we're gonna stick with that. Okay, we could do general utility and, and impo impose it later, but let's let's just stick with that. Okay, so h is gonna be the log of what? So it's gonna be the log of qp. Okay, so the log of y, which is the log of qp, which is really the log of q times one minus r. Okay, so it's q. This is p, which is one minus r. Okay, um, nice. Uh, and then plus mu. Okay, so this is uh, this is now the new different mu. Okay, this is the the Hamiltonian uh, thing um, and times. Uh, Q dot. Okay, so now I guess we needed that too. Uh, what is Q dot? Remember, uh, I'll write it over here. So, also, let's see. Uh, Q dot. I guess I guess this is really what what we were interested in. Q dot over Q G is equal to log of one plus lambda times tau, okay, which is itself equal to, to gamma r, okay? So at the end of the day, q dot is equal to what? So it's equal to q, you know, moving this over, times the growth rate, which is log 1 plus lambda tau, which is gamma r, okay? So at the end of the day, like this is this this is the growth rate, log 1 plus lambda times tau, which is gamma r, and you just have to make sure that you put a q on there because this is q dot. This is not the growth rate, it's q dot. Okay, so that you have to include that proportionality explicitly here. That's important. Okay. Um, all right, so then that's our that's our thing there. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna define uh, lambda tilde as that logarithmic term, log of one plus lambda, because I don't feel like writing that a hundred times. Okay, so h is equal to log of uh, q one minus r plus uh, mu q. Now this is lambda tilde gamma r. Okay. So that's our that's our optimization. Okay. That's a ham that's a well defined Hamiltonian. Q is our state variable. R is our choice variable, and we can just just hammer it out. Okay. Um, all right. So let's do that. So then. Uh, First, let's do our, our choice variable first order condition. Zero is equal to hr, which is equal to what? Okay, so we could have done this beforehand, but we can see that this is separable. This is log of q plus log of one minus r there. Okay, so, so really that hr is just the derivative of that log of one minus r, which is minus one over one minus r. Okay, remember that chain rule there. Okay, so that's the first part. The second part's coming. I need to take a quick sip of the old coffee. Um, the second part is, well, that's fairly straightforward. It's just R times a bunch of stuff. Okay, and in, that, in this case, this stuff is until the gamma. Okay. Um, been making my own coffee these days. Starbucks is closed. They're, they're definitely closed. I think they're closed everywhere, but like certain hospitals, making my own coffee. It's been fun. It's a technique, you know, getting better over time. Uh, personally, a fan of the the Italian and the French roasts, the extra dark uh, roasts. Um, but you know, everyone's got their own particular tastes. But that's that's what I'm into these days. Um, okay, uh, so that's our first starting condition. We can. Simplify that a little bit into a something equals something equation. That's always good. Uh, all right, so that's going to keep that around. That's that's like our mu equals mu, prime, mu, mu equals u prime c equation, which we then like take the growth rate of. We may need to do that as well here. Okay, so let's keep that around. This is like equation one. All right. Um, well, I don't know. Okay. It's not implied by equation one. It is equation one. So I'll write the one over here. Okay. Um, okay. So then, uh, the other equation of course is our Hamiltonian multiplier equation, which is going to say that rho is our, is our discount rate. Okay. And then 
we've got no population growth rate here by design. So then that's just row. It's not row minus n. Okay. Uh, and then that's going to be equal to h of our state variable, which is q. So hq. All right. Uh, okay. So what is that? Again, so this separates out. So then the, the q term is only going to pick up a 1 minus q. The q derivative is only going to pick up that 1 minus q. And then plus some stuff, which is, again, just a linear, you know, term uh, q. So mu gamma tilde. Uh, so mu lambda tilde gamma r. Okay. Nice. Um, all right. So now we get to our old hobby of killing off lambda. Poor lambda always gets killed off, but you know what? It's it's made up and fictitious. At some point, you got to outgrow it. Um, so we're going to do that. And the way we're going to do it is well, it's it's a little bit of a funky way, but you know this is one over q. One over q is going to be equal to like mu lambda tilde gamma times one minus r. So we just kind of rearrange this to plug in for one minus q, and we're going to get something that's proportional to mu, which means we get to cancel mu, uh, at least like aside from the growth rate, and then we'll be all set. Okay, so let's not get ahead of ourselves here. So row mu minus mu dot. Uh, so one over q, that's going to be q lambda tilde gamma times one minus r, which looks tantalizingly similar to this term here. And in fact, you can see they're going to partially cancel. Okay. Um, all right. And then, sorry. How, yeah, let's kill that Q off. We're going to replace that Q with mu, which is what it really should be. So this should be mu. Yeah, so 1 over Q is mu lambda tilde gamma of 1 minus R. Thank you. Um, all right, so now and that, now it actually does look similar to this. OK. Um, all right, and that's equal to, OK, so then, then this is rho mu mu dot um and this okay so here you can see mu lambda tilde gamma one minus r mu lambda tilde gamma r the r parts cancel and you just get mu lambda tilde gamma all right uh so that's like that's pretty simple all right um and at this point everything is simplified and proportional to the mu so let's go ahead and divide uh Rho, we divide by mu, and so you get rho minus that mu growth rate, uh, and then lambda tilde times gamma, all right? Uh, or if you wish, as usual, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna combine on minus the growth rate of mu. Okay. Now this is a familiar looking term that showed up in the tau equation before. Okay, so that's gonna be important. Okay, so uh, the, the right hand side that is so so the, the minus the growth rate of mu is lambda tilde times gamma minus rho. All right. Um, okay, now what's next? Okay, so now we need to this is like equation two, I guess, in some sense. Uh, we're going to use this. Let's keep this around. Let's circle it, box it off. Uh, we're going to use that now, the question is, what is the growth rate of mu? Well, this equation is true at every given time period, at any given time period. So we can uh, we can differentiate it. We can growthify it. We can do various things. We're going to growthify it in this case um, and then find uh, some kind of answer. All right. So now we arrive at that fateful point, critical juncture, uh, where we need to decide, are we? Oh, Jake, Jacob, you got a question. What's up? Okay. Yep. Uh huh. Mm hmm. So here. So this is, okay, so we got log integral of log of L, right? 
li is equal to p, right? So this is really the integral of log of p. And this integral is from 0 to 1 so of a constant, so it's just going to be whatever is inside. Right, so this isn't doing like another aggregation on p. All this is saying is that li is equal to p. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like q where it's like the it's the definition. It's yeah, it's just a constant. Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, okay, so so we want to growthify this. Yeah. So the critical juncture, do we go down the possibility? Do we entertain the possibility that R might be changing over time and find a differential equation in R, which is going to be a quadratic form, which we're going to get the same answer. I'm going to say let's not do that and say that we didn't. Um, but let's note that you know, we could do it and it would basically give us the same sort of somewhat tedious process of, of, of ruling out certain things. And at the end of the day, we would conclude that in fact, we would have a constant R from the get-go regardless of the level of Q. Okay, so we're gonna say R dot equals zero. We're gonna guess R dot equals zero and or just kind of assume it really and, and go from there. Okay, but you can do it. You can do it the, the more thorough way um, and I, I think yeah, I do that in the notes. So if you want to go check it out in the notes, okay? So if, if r dot equals zero, basically when we growthify this equation, this side is zero, okay? So it's zero. And then the right-hand side is just the sum of these four growth rates. Well, mu, that's what we want. That's good. That's one. And then q. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just call it g, why not? Um, and then lambda, that's not moving around. Gamma's not moving around. That's pretty much it, okay? Um, okay, so we got that equation, and then, good, that's the right answer. Um, so now actually, it's pretty pretty straightforward getting to the, the solution. Okay, well then this means that, you know, if, if we wanna phrase it in terms of minus mu dot over mu, that's equal to g, okay? And then we just combine these two eliminating the, the negative mu growth rate, which then says that G is equal to lambda tilde gamma minus rho. And that, my friends, is economics. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, that's our growth rate. Simpler this time than last time, okay? Now the, the growth rate, um, let's just jump back to the equilibrium and recall uh, the growth rate in equilibrium Uh, yeah, yeah, we could assume, I mean, we could, we could have, right? It, it wouldn't be as, as technically correct, you know, uh, but we could any, you know, for expanding varieties, either equilibrium social planner or Schumpeterian equilibrium social planner, we can assume R equals zero and that's going to be the correct assumption, uh, and, and just go, go straight for it. Yeah. Um, but but to prove it, really, you need to go through the whole process. You can, C-A-N, you can do it because you can. Yeah, but but the question is SR now, right? You, you don't, don't, don't worry about the, the possibility that SR is moving over time. That's, so the analog here is, is really, you know, RR is like SR in a, in a population growth rate world. Right, because um, we have a unit population, or at least a constant. So yeah, but but still, don't don't worry about transient dynamics in SR, basically. Yep, um, it's just a big hassle, and it's and it, the answer is almost always that it's not moving from the from the start, right? So, um, okay, so now the remember the so this is like I don't know G hat, uh, and then G star. The equilibrium was. Uh, this, oh. okay, so see, yeah, now there I got, um, I have another delta, so let's do rho, and then this is over one plus lambda. Okay, so, um, the, where did I get this? Or, This comes from taking the growth rate of one, g of one. 
here. So this is zero now on the left hand side because I dot zero. And then we pick up the, the growth rate of mu and q. Yep. Um, all right, so okay, so that so this is our our optimal, right? This is our our equilibrium. Now if it weren't for one minor wrinkle, which is the tilde, we'd be able to say that, well, this is just the equilibrium growth rate divided by uh, one plus lambda. So it's 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 got to be lower. Uh, Guillermo? It's optimal. I'm calling it G hat because it's the social socially optimal one. Yeah. It, but it's still G. It's still G. It's just the, the optimal one. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. If it weren't for this tilde, we could say, oh, well, then this clearly... Uh, uh, G star is less than G hat. There's an underinvestment in research, just like in the in the expanding varieties model. Okay, but the tilde is there. What's up with the tilde? Um, okay, so let's investigate that. And the way we're going to do that is by plotting something. Okay, got our axes. We're plotting as a function of lambda some stuff. That's a really ugly lambda. That's a function of lambda. We're plotting some stuff. And in particular, we're going to plot log of 1 plus lambda, which is lambda tilde. And, uh, and then we're going to plot lambda too. OK, so we're, we're comparing these, these two terms, basically. OK, so if we do that uh, at 0, they're both 0. Okay, so let's let's start with log of one plus lambda is lambda tilde. At zero, this is log of one, which is zero. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe we want to think about what's the derivative. It's gonna be one over one plus lambda. And at zero, that's the derivative is one. Okay, so and that's you know also true for lambda itself. Okay, so they have the same slope at zero, they have the same value at zero. They look pretty similar. Uh, but the logarithmic function, we know that's concave, that's strictly concave. So it's gonna that second derivative is gonna pull it down. Okay, so then you know maybe it's better. Let's draw the let's draw the with our technical assist here. Uh, lambda, okay, and then this is gotta bend the curve, guys. Uh, so this is log of one plus lambda, uh, and this is lambda. Okay, so it's gonna be a little bit lower. Okay, so it's gonna be uh, strictly lower at any positive value, they happen to be equal to zero and they're both equal to zero. Okay. So what does that portend? Uh, that means actually that it's not entirely clear because this thing, this lambda tilde is less than this lambda, right? So, so if this denominator weren't here, then there'd be an overinvestment in equilibrium. Okay. But so, so then they're both there, then it's kind of ambiguous. Okay. Um, essentially, it, it just depends on on which one wins out. Okay, so and and there's not a, there's not like a hundred percent clear cut answer. Um, like if you think about, you can get some you can get some traction in terms of like when is there an over versus under investment. The 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 I mean the first answer is there may be an over investment, there may be an under investment. It kind of depends on lambda. Okay, that's the first broad answer. Okay, the more specific answer is. Uh, you can say particular things for particular lambda values. Okay, for instance, <clears throat> think about. Okay, so we we've determined that uh, for any positive lambda, let's assume lambda is positive, but things are actually interesting. Uh, lambda tilde is less than lambda. Okay, but then um, you know one basically one is greater than one over one plus lambda. This term here. Okay, so these are the two competing effects. But but. Uh, this is going to be true, okay. So then, if you if if you bring lambda down to a point where uh, uh, think about think about the case where lambda tilde gamma is equal to rho, which is to say, you know, lambda tilde equals uh, rho over gamma. Okay, think about that particular lambda. What's that? What's that going to imply? Well, that that would imply that g hat kind of, by the way we constructed it, is zero. Okay, that was constructed so that g hat was zero, and that g star 
Actually, it's positive because this lambda is greater than lambda tilde. So G star is positive. Okay, and I mean, G star is equal to um, lambda gamma minus lambda tilde gamma over one plus lambda, which is, you know, uh, I don't know, gamma times lambda minus lambda tilde. So it's equal to something positive, right? Um, not really important exactly what it is. It's equal to something positive. Okay, so what I've given you here is at least one point where there's an overinvestment in equilibrium. At this at this particular lambda value, which is not necessarily unreasonable, uh, the social planner optimally says, well, I'm kind of, you know, impatient enough and the research isn't quite good enough that I'm just going to set zero for my optimal research level. And meanwhile, the equilibrium is like, hell yeah, let's keep doing research because we're stealing products from each other and, and we like that. So they're just churning away when really they should just not. Okay. So um, there's an overinvestment in research and equilibrium. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the basic idea for where you can get an overinvestment. Okay. And that comes from, this is like the overinvestment force. Okay. Which is that, uh, this is like the social return. When you think about, think about increasing tau. What's the effect of increasing tau? Well, it increases G by a factor of, of lambda tilde log of one plus lambda. Okay. Socially. All right. Um, now the firms though, they they think about things in terms of profits, okay? And so, when they successfully uh, when they when they innovate, they kick out the old firm, okay? They get a lot. Right? They get they get all of the profit or the yeah, they get the whole profit stream associated with that uh, uh, that particular product, and they don't really care that they kicked out another firm, okay? So they're getting like a hundred percent. Whereas the the uh, the social planner is sort of like okay we, can't, we really care about the net increase okay in in productivity and hence output okay so so that's kind of the difference here is is that like firms are just jockeying for a position and they they get a little excited okay and they they're they're overcompensated here okay um, the other thing which can lead to underinvestment is is this which which is so this is like the under term um, this is really uh, short time horizons this rep this is a manifestation of short time horizons we'll do we'll go back to the graph in a minute and we can see exactly how that looks uh this is a manifestation of short time horizons because firms get because they get kicked out uh, in the event of creative destruction their 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 discount rate is like is like row plus tau whereas the social planners discount rate is just row okay and that shows up as a as a as a drag on what they're doing because they they they, they, relatively speaking, do too little research. Okay, so if you think about, um, let's see, is there a limiting? So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it should, yeah, I mean, basically, like. I don't. I don't think I'm going to prove this 100. percent But at you know, as as lambda gets larger, okay, uh, then this is going to push down G star. Okay, um, it, it is true that this differential is going to change as well. But there, there's going to be some often going to be some point, at least in the middle, where this thing wins over, where the short time horizons become important. Okay, and and empirically speaking, that may be a very relevant range. Okay, so theoretically, it's it's some there's some, you know, like. Um, there's some point where where this is going to be important for a medium lambda. Uh, empirically, that may actually be an important zone to think about for for what are what are the incentives of firms relative to the social optima. Okay, so um, yeah. So then, and then if we go to that graph, and I guess I won't. Such a beautiful graph, and and so well drawn and carefully drawn that I think I guess I should reuse it, um, but. All jokes aside, uh, you know, essentially that that's what we're seeing here. Okay, um, so I'm not going to go through and derive this marginal benefit being constant. You you can show kind of puristically that the that the marginal benefit is is not going to be a function of R. 
and that the reason that the, for for the social planner so this is like the hat had a social planner star is equilibrium the reason that the marginal benefit for private firms goes down with r is because it created destruction artificially discounting the future because you get kicked out at some point okay that's why this thing's going down and that's why in this case you know it's a very stark difference between our star and our hat you know maybe it's too much but you know you get a big underinvestment because this thing is decreasing okay um but uh let's see yeah um actually yeah and i guess so th now this is in terms of r okay i think that so so if you maybe if you just look at r you do get another investment i need to think about that a little bit more but 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 i mean in terms of r you can see that in this case that 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 under investment is sort of like takes a day and you get that the equilibrium value is lower than the social planner okay and then you, know, you can see from these intersections okay so um i need to think about that for a second so let's let's do that next class but but here you can see that there's, there's like a big under investment in general it's, though it's going to depend on the exact value of lambda okay uh so i think we're out of time here um so that's actually we're that's actually a kind of a clean break here in terms of content i mean we're pretty much done with the schumpeterian model okay um and we don't have that much time left in the in the course uh so we have like two weeks left i think or like maybe three or four four classes now um what is our let me make sure i'm not totally misleading you guys uh April 22nd, right? Okay, so the final is April 22nd. So I have my calendar, good. Um, so, and it's the sixth now. So we have basically three classes because you guys have other finals that week um, to go. So the I, I guess what I'm gonna do is, um, there's another model after after uh, the Schipitarian model, which is sort of an extension of it called the cutting cord to model, which is kind of cool. It, it, it makes firms more interesting rather than just one product firms. So We'll go over that um, a little bit, okay? And that'll introduce you to some new techniques as well. Um, and then after that, I guess there's some stuff that I want to do continuous time. It's like uh, stochastic, like value functions and continuous time, how to introduce stochastic elements like Brownian motion, stuff like that. Uh, so sort of like, gen those are like useful tools um, that I think whatever you, you end up doing, that's, those are gonna be potentially useful tools for kind of solving um, models with stochastic elements at the micro level. No lab equipment. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I mean, we've already done lab equipment doesn't add that much new to, to the setting. Okay. I mean it's, it's kind of neat because it comes out pretty linear and it's simple to solve. But fundamentally it's it's an expanding varieties model. Uh or, I mean it could be actually it could be both, depending on how you set it up. So um yeah, I don't I don't think it's worth worth going through that because it's not there's not that much value added there. Okay. Uh for the for the lab equipment model. Right. Um, yeah. So we'll just do. Yeah. So I think we'll we'll just do this cutting card to model, and then then continuous time optimization and stoch with stochastic elements, um, and then and then do some review, and then that's pretty much it. Okay. So. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. So I guess that's that's all I got for today.